Okay, and you'll probably have to choose then that you accept the recording. All right, so hello everyone. I should say good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending upon where in the world you are today um, for our webcast on um, HathiTrust A Little 101. Uh, my colleague, Jessica Rohr, a member engagement and communication specialist, is going to um, talk to us about um, Hati Trust and who we are and what we do. I'm going to start out with a little bit of housekeeping. So we're asking that everybody keep their uh, microphones muted and their cameras off um, while we're presenting. And then we will take questions uh, through the chat. So feel free to type questions anytime into the chat. And then for the sake of the recording, I'll be reading them aloud uh, for answering um, during the presentation. Um, okay, and we are going to share the slides afterwards. So don't worry about that. We will share the slides um, and the recording link with you um, tomorrow. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. Thank you, Melissa. And yes, I get to say happy Friday on Thursday evening here because I know that we've got many, many folks joining us from Australia, um, but we do represent coast to coast here in the States as well. So um, happy Friday or happy Friday Eve to the rest of you. Um, as Melissa said, we have been offering this series um, for the past month or so. We'll have a few more into September, but How Do You Trust 101 webinar series has been really created in mind um, of, for current and new members to dive a bit deeper, um, different topics that maybe you wouldn't know about otherwise um, or have always wanted to know more about but haven't had a chance to catch up with us. So recently we have presented on contributing content and ingest. Um, last week, the week before, I lose track now, um, we talked about integrating catalog records into your catalog or discovery system. And we will be talking about the Accessible Text Request Service in September. So this session today is designed to be a much more broad overview. We'll talk about governance, we'll talk about the collection and the services that the collection enables. Uh, we'll get into some nitty gritty of tips and tricks to promote the service and different services on your campus. And we'll talk about how to get help and how you can get involved and stay involved in Hathi Trust. So if you missed any of the other Hathi Trust webinars, they are available on our YouTube channel and they came out in the last issue of the newsletter last week. So we should be able to catch you up. So as I said, we have some new members. Um, really, our roster is growing exponentially and certainly since the pandemic and the needs that our member libraries have had to create new ways of accessing information and text. Um, so we've welcomed 24 new members just since March. Um, a lot of them have said that they joined specifically to take advantage of the emergency temporary access service. So no matter the reason, uh, we're glad to have you. It's been a big couple of years um, for new members joining, as you can see. So it's nice to see many of you joining us here today. Starting at the beginning, um, if you didn't know already, Hadi Trust turned 10 years old in 2018. We did have a party, we had multiple parties, and we did have party hats, including our elephant here. Um, so while Hadi Trust is founded, we say that we were founded in 2008 because that is when the then CIC, now Big Ten um, Academic Association, those 12 schools, along with the University of California system, they announced the formation of Hathi Trust. But actually, our roots go back a bit further. So Google started doing mass digitization efforts uh, with a number of schools in 2004, 2005. Um, Stanford, New York Public Library, the University of Michigan, Oxford, and let's see, what am I missing? Uh, Harvard were the five schools that Google originally partnered with. And so this was wonderful. I mean, this was a great opportunity. Um, as this was happening though, a number of the schools came together and said, whoa, 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 what are we gonna do? How are we going to keep this content, this material that is coming out of our shelves within the reach of the scholarly community? And so that was really the impetus behind 
forming Hati Trust. So creating that shared infrastructure, investing in long-term preservation of these items for the scholarly record and under the management of the scholarly community. So the, you know, 2008 is when we mark our beginnings, but certainly it went back further than that. So something to make note of as well is that while we rely on Google to really have formed the basis for our collection, in fact, we still 95% of the items in the corpus were Google digitized, we're not affiliated with Google in any formal way. Um, our collections are very different. There's some overlap, um, but Google Books, for example, does have a lot of marketplace um, trade commercial material that Hadi Trust does not. Um, and certainly we have a lot of uh, scholarly academic titles that Google Books does not. That said, um, we do continue to work with Google. We work with them on different um, optimization of the material itself, um, new digitization streams. So we certainly continue to partner with them. Um, the best thing I can say though is that we are different. We are a nonprofit and we are really focused on managing this collection for the interests of the scholarly community and not the corporate bottom line. So since our founding in 2008, our mission has not changed, um, not in the slightest. We have not even you know, wavered from our dedication to preserving the scholarly record, to creating as many access points to it as possible, to sharing it out widely, communicating um, about the items in the corpus. And so with that, we have been able to grow into some new services and opportunities, which I'll be talking about, but also to really start looking ahead, um, really saying, what are we gonna do now? We've been around for 10, 12 years. Um, what are we gonna do with all this material? And when I say we, I mean the whole membership collective, the 170 plus um, member libraries that have come together and the, Vision here was something that membership worked on um, in 2018 to really come up with this five-year plan. What are we going to do? And you, many people have heard me say this. I still read it now and I genuinely get chills because we are in the middle of providing some of these new forms of and, and supporting some of the new forms of teaching, learning, and research that are underway um, in the world at, at such an exponential rate right now. So that's where we continue to to the head, I want to talk a little bit about how we come together as an organization. Um, you may know us mostly as the catalog interface, but there are a lot of workings behind that. This is the staff. Um, these are the 12 individuals who form the core staff of Hathi Trust. Uh, we have roles in technical infrastructure, collections development, outreach, um, a digital scholarship. We've all got a hand in helping Hathi Trust run. Um, we are kind of the eyes and the ears. I will tell you more about who else is involved, um, but these are the core staff. I would be remiss to not point out that we also have a big team um, behind us, both um, in different parts of the, the country, I'll talk about that more, but also at our home base here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So we work closely with the University of Michigan Library um, IT team. So we work with developers and sysadmins there too, who help us keep Hadi Trust up and running. We are much larger, however, than just our home base here at the University of Michigan. It is our administrative home, but in order to keep Hadi Trust moving in all the different ways that it does, we also have partners in different areas. So we work with the, um, let's see, uh, California Digital Library is home to our Zephyr team, which does our, our metadata management. So if you've been a content contributor, you've likely worked with that team um, to contribute your metadata to the, the corpus. The How Do you Trust Research Center is hosted jointly at the um, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Indiana University. And Indiana University is also home to our sort of backup storage facility. So we have um, redundant storage for all the digital objects in the library and one of those copies is there at Indiana University. So all in all from Berkeley to Baltimore we have about 60 different people who in one way shape or form are helping Hadi Trust run on a day-to-day, -day, month to month, year-to-year basis. 
So you've heard the back end, who's behind the uh, interface there and the catalog search, but it really truly is the members who are the engine. So we are a member driven organization. Um, we were founded specifically with keeping members, you know, member library association for each other. Um, that's where we got our roots and we're still funded 100% by member dues. So our governance is member driven and Melissa will talk about that in a minute too, but really without, without the members, we, we are nothing. We are but a catalog interface. So this is a glimpse of where everyone is in the world. Um, as mentioned, there are a number of you calling in from Australia. Uh, this year we've welcomed a number of new members from Canada. I know that there are folks on the call from Canada as well, um, England, and then a slew of colleges and universities from across the United States. So we have a number of state systems also represented. Um, but as you saw from the list earlier, we really are growing um, a lot. We generally have 10 to 12 new member libraries each year. And this year we have doubled that. So we will welcome everyone on board. Um, something kind of technical that I wanted to talk about right now is the print holdings. So every single member that has joined Hattie Trust has submitted print holdings. Um, this is a pretty detailed um, series of files that itemize for us the different items that you have in your print holdings collection. And I bring it up here because it's a really important driver of both annual fees as well as a number of the services that Hadi Trust is able to provide. So it's been a while since we have solicited an annual submission. We're in the process of revising how we actually do this, but um, you have likely been um, thinking about this maybe if you've been using the emergency temporary access service. Um, but it will also come up as the annual fee cycle comes up after the first of the year. So member benefits, I'm going to go into these in a lot more detail, but member benefits are everything from downloading items in the public domain to having some exceptional access to an advanced computing environment at the Hadi Trust Research Center, um, as well as access for patrons with print disabilities. So there are preservation benefits, um, different access benefits for members. While we continue to really think about the common good and what we can be doing for libraries at large and the scholarly community at large, we do want to make sure that we are providing some really unique benefits to our members and their academic community. I am going to turn it over to Melissa, who will help you understand how members have a role in leading this organization. All right, thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about governance. So Haji Trust, we are led by a board of governors. Um, that board of governors um, is made up of 12 members from our member institutions. And you need to be the designated member representative of your institution to serve on the board of governors. So for most of our members, that is the library director, but not all. Um, so six members of the Board of Governors are appointed by our founding institutions. So two members are from the Big Ten Academic Alliance, uh, one member from University of Michigan, our host institution, one member from Indiana University, and two members from the University of California system. Um, the remaining six members are voted um, from the membership and so um, they serve three-year terms and we send out a call for uh, interest and they can nominate and then um, we hold an election uh, to elect those members. Um, underneath the Board of Governors is the Executive Director, um, who at this time is Mike Furlow, who um, runs the operations of our organization. Um, and then we have the Program Steering Committee. Uh, the Program Steering Committee is primarily made up of um, Associate University Librarians, AULs. Um, the Program Steering Committee is responsible for developing, assessing, and implementing strategies for policies and programs of Hathi Trust. It serves as an initiator and reviewer of program opportunities, providing essential linkage between member interests and organizational directions. I'm reading that from our bylaws. Uh, the Program Steering Committee meets twice a month. So that's a quite a deep um, 
time commitments that they take and, and they are appointed by the Board of Governors uh, to three year terms and once again um, every year we do a call and people can nominate and then um, the Board of Governors reviews those nominations and chooses um, who, who is, will be able to serve. Um, part of what the Program Steer Steering Committee does um, in reviewing policies, they develop uh, a lot of times working groups and task forces to help um, promote our strategic in initiatives. And that's another opportunity for people to get involved in um, helping out with Hati Trust. So again, our membership are the primary beneficiaries of Hati Trust programs and services and support these activities uh, through the payment of fees. Um, so I, once again, our, our, most of our programs are paid by member fees. Um, and some of the responsibilities listed here, again, um, they approve the criteria for membership, um, elect six of the Board of Governors, um, every year, the membership needs to vote on the budget, so member representatives will receive a ballot. The, the budget we will publish um, in October, and then um, we will put out a vote, and all members need to vote to approve the budget um, every year. Um, also, anytime we make an amendation of the bylaws, we have the me membership needs to vote. And the Board of Governors, again, is representative of the membership and um, relies heavily on input from the membership. All right, here's just a list of active working groups that we have um, going on right now. Um, we currently have a Statement of Values and Code of Conduct Task Force. And again, task forces, how we define them here at Hathi Trust, they serve a limited amount of time, uh, usually a less than a year, a, a, or 18 months, a 12 to 18 month term, whereas our working groups a little bit longer terms and they, they are uh, perpetual. So uh, they'll serve a, a two to three year term and then, then they would be reappointed or we would appoint new members. So those teams um, keep going. The user support team is so, so valuable in everything that we do. Um, so if you've ever sent in um, to feedback, um, you are working with our user support team. Um, Jessica is gonna talk a little bit more about them uh, later. We've also have advisory committees for our um, federal documents and shared print programs. And then um, there is the list there of those other um, steering committee task force and working groups that we have um, going on right now. All right, now I'm gonna talk um, pretty quickly, just a very rough overview about how um, the fee model works. So um, member fees include two components. Uh, the first component is based on the number of public domain volumes held by Hathi Trust. And so our membership, we divide them into three tiers uh, based on total library expenditures as reported in public sources and all members in the same tier pay the same amount for supporting public domain materials. And then the second component is a proportional share of the per volume cost um, in, to support copyrighted volumes that overlap with the volumes held in an institution's print collection. And that amount varies across the membership because each member's collection differs in content and size. And then those two figures are combined to assess the total fee for each member. And um, the reason the fee model is a bit complicated because it's designed to be fair. Um, it's designed to um, communicate the volumes uh, held in the print collection and then um, in proportion to the, um, what am I saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's designed to be equitable. So basically, um, the more members we have drives down fees because the fees are spread across the membership. And that's, um, we don't need to get in, into any more detail than that today. If you have any questions though, let me know. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica to talk about programs and services. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, so everything that you have seen up until this point, the collection, the governance model, everything is about delivering programs and services to you, our members. 
So you might have known more about us from the digital library itself. So the 17.4 million items that are held in the digital library is usually people's first entry point to Hathi Trust. It's a big number. It's pretty impressive, but we really are more than just that. Um, the collection itself enables us and our members to do a lot more than just have access to these items. The mass digitization itself has created opportunities to enable collection management at a scale, you know, from an individual library, but much larger, looking across many libraries together. It's enabled large scale questions that only text and data mining can help us answer. We've got, I think it's two trillion tokens, individual words that are available for text and data mining through the Heidi Trust Research Center. And certainly there is this corpus, some of which can be um, always, we're always looking for more ways to make that accessible. So whether we can do that through uh, copyright review programming or helping people with rights management, um, we really aim to preserve and provide access to the collection. And we're coming up with new services and ideas for services all the time. Um, I think that together with our members, we are able to identify what else, what are the other possibilities that this collective collection enable us to take advantage of. So the Accessible Text Request Service is where I'm going to start. Um, this is a service available only to members. Um, it enables patrons with a print disability to access any title in the corpus, regardless of copyright status. So we work with our member libraries to uh, set this up. We don't validate eligibility. We don't ourselves mediate those texts, but we do work with you to set that up on your campus. Sometimes it's with the library. Sometimes it's through um, an office for students with disabilities but that is something that we can work with you on. The majority of our members are taking advantage of that. We are starting to talk to some others who may not be registered for the service uh, to make sure that they can take advantage of this for their campus community. The shared print program is an extraordinary example of how the collective collection enables us to do more together than we could independently. So the aim of this shared print program in Hadi Trust is to steward a print copy of all the digital copies in the Hadi Trust Library. So to date, we have received commitments from our member libraries to retain a print copy that's also shared in the digital library for 76% of our monographs. So they committed to retain them for up to 25 years. And we continue to grow this program. Um, we're looking at different ways that we can enable services um, with this increased resource sharing. Um, but certainly the preservation component is something that our members are interested in, both from a preservation perspective, but also a cost sharing model. As I mentioned before, one of our core missions from the beginning is to make the items in Hadi Trust as available to as many individuals as possible. So we've six point, excuse me, six plus million items are open in the public domain in the United States. Um, there are approximately 4.4 million available worldwide. So for those of you joining from Canada, Australia, um, that number is more like 4.4 million. Uh, but we continue to work on this. Um, access is everything from like the accessible text request service, but also for us, it really is about making items available that should be available. So whether this is our FedDocs program that has 1.5 million items in it for US, um, or the copyright review program, the team of copyright reviewers are made up of member librarians. So they receive training, they commit time um, to do this work, and every week they are finding hundreds and hundreds of records in Hadi Trust that they can then open in the public domain. Uh, there's a new program happening this year that's focused on Crown Copyright. So I know that that team has a number of Canadian um, librarians working on that, perhaps a few from Australia as well, but they are focusing on doing the same kind of copyright review work for Crown Copyright items. Um, I think 
I just heard Christina Eden, who's our program manager, say they're really focused on Canadian Fed docs. So that's going to be exciting to see how that turns out in the coming months. The Hattie Trust Research Center, as I said, is our text and data mining arm of the organization. Um, through the Hattie Trust Research Center, users who are less familiar with text and data mining tools can find something to just begin their exploration. And then advanced researchers, if they are with a Hattie Trust member institution, they can apply to have a data capsule, which is a dedicated advanced computing environment to do some pretty heavy data crunching. So the Research Center provides text and data mining tools, um, both for the general public, those are, there's a few kind of plug and play options, but then more in-depth um, tools for our member libraries. Also, there are training uh, videos that are available, and we also have a used to be in-person, but right now is virtual, a workshop series that we host at different member institutions around the country. And I'm sure now that we are doing more virtual work. I haven't seen any official requests come in from our Canadian institutions or our members in Australia, but I think that if it isn't on your radar, keep an eye out for it, because I think we will start um, vetting those interests um, for spring. One of our newest services certainly is not as much fun as the party hat. So here's our trusty elephant with a very safe, very sound, green mask. And of course, I'm talking about the Emergency Temporary Access Service. So this is something that we realized we could make available um, back in March as things were really starting to get bad here stateside. Um, we realized that we could really stretch our legs in terms of fair use and make titles available in the corpus, in the digital library that our members have on their own shelves. So this has been something we have offered since late March, early April, and it's, we hear, been a benefit to a lot of our member libraries. So we can do this, we can provide this service because of all the digital contributions that members have made over the past 10 to 12 years. Um, that's, again, another thing that we can think about in terms of at scale. This collective collection enables us to do things not only for ourselves, but for everyone, for the collective library academic community. So speaking of this collective collection, as I have been doing, I want to give you a little more information about the collection itself. So it would not exist were it not for human hands. We have a digital collection, certainly, as I've said, 17.4 million items, but every single page that you pull up on the um, interface is something that was screened by human hands. So I just want to acknowledge that our collection is still very much a human touch, and we are very grateful for those who've contributed, but also to those countless nameless individuals, I think, who have been scanning and continue to scan to this day. So we are indebted. So these are just some little bits of numbers. It's hard to wrap your brain around. I was right, 2.5 trillion words indexed, um, 6.1 billion pages. I, have a nine-year-old and those numbers probably mean more to him than they do to me, but we know it's a lot. And everything that we have in the collection, as I mentioned, has been contributed by member libraries. So we've got different sources for those digitization streams, which I'll talk about, but this is a snapshot of what we have today, thanks to our member contributors. So as you can see from left to right here on your screen in 2008, when we started, there were two contributors. The blue is University of Michigan and the green is, I believe, Wisconsin. Over time, we have invited more and more contributors, um, more and more people have joined. And so I believe now in 2020, we've got more than 60 members contributing content to Hathi Trust. If you look at the collection by language, um, this reflects much of what you would expect to find on your own shelves. So given, of course, that our collection has been um, contributed by academic and research libraries, many of them here in the United States and North America, our collection skews very um, towards English language as well as Romance languages. So 
you can see we've got strong representation from German, French, Spanish, but overall we have more than 450 languages represented in the collection. Again, probably not much of a surprise. Um, this looks much like many of your shelves, I'm sure. We have a strong showing in the humanities, everything from history to literature. Um, we have some unique collections. Um, we have a large collection of sheet music. I saw it last week, um, somebody was passing around on social media, um, one of the collections of women composers. So we do have some strong showings and some surprising areas. But generally speaking, it is very much a representation of what you would find in most academic research libraries. There are some curated collections. Um, again, this was like the female composers collection that I mentioned, and there are just dozens and dozens of these. Some of them have been curated by institutions like the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, um, the see the California legislative publications. That was something that I believe California Digital Library had a strong hand in. Um, the Negro University Presses is another new collection. Um, this came to our attention and we put it through the copyright review program that I mentioned previously. And they were able to identify more than a thousand titles from Negro University Presses that could be opened in the public domain. And they created a collection for this. So there's things that people are doing on their own just for fun, lots of detective, detective novels and lots of cookbook collections, but there are some larger ones that are pretty outstanding too. So what would all of this collection be worth if we couldn't actually access it? So very briefly, I want to highlight what the world was like before emergency temporary access. So the copyrighted items that people are perhaps accessing now through emergency temporary access, those are not usually available to anyone, whether they are a member or not a member. Um, copyright law applies globally. And so items that we have in the collection, even if a member library contributed, contributed it, are not available for reading in a browser. You can search all the text, um, that is absolutely available. And with some special exceptions, for the Accessible Text Request Service, for example, um, they can access items that are held in copyright. But generally speaking, these are available for full text search only, not for viewing um, or reading in the browser. Public domain items, on the other hand, whether it's through US copyright or worldwide global copyright, those are available both to read and then also to download in full for members. So whereas a non-member may have to download page by page of a 400 page you know, book, the member can download that title in its complete form. So there's some special access, as I'd mentioned, on research um, at the Howdy Trust Research Center that members are able to apply for the data capsule environment, but both copyrighted and public domain items are available for research use as well. One of the most important things you can tell your patrons is to log in. Logging in in the button there on the upper right of the screen, that is the ticket to all the member benefits. And whether that is getting access to download an item in public domain or accessing temporary access titles, logging in is the most important thing you can do. Once you do that, you can jump into full text search, catalog search, those function very similarly to what I would imagine um, you are finding and what you have in your own catalog and discovery systems. I won't go into details there, um, but really logging in is the key to getting the most out of an individual user's Howdy Trust experience. There are some other ways to make the most of your membership. So I'd mentioned all the contributors, the 60 some institutions that have been contributing or are new contributors. Um, most of them are Google affiliates. So they're partnering with Google to digitize and continue digitizing items in their sh on their shelves. But many work with Internet Archive. There are a number of local digitization projects um, that members undertake. And we work with you to set up the specifications and the different content streams for optimal ingest. So there are ways that you can um, really start working with Hadi Trust in a deeper way if you have the means and the interest to do some digitization. 
why deposit? I think by now you have probably realized that depositing and building this collection is everything. It really is why the institutions came together in 2008 to really form and strengthen a, a shared infrastructure for preservation, but then access long to the future. So preservation and access being the core, uh, depositing new items enables more items for search, um, for people to do the research um, at the research center. Um, anything that you can imagine people would want to access for the emergency temporary access service certainly is available because contributors have decided to deposit items. So lots of reasons to deposit new content, but certainly it is the core of our mission to contribute, excuse me, to continue preserving items in the collection for access long into the future. There are some other kind of do-it-yourself um, data feeds that you can take advantage of either for some advanced um, metadata management activities or for different kinds of catalog and discovery layer integrations. There are data sets and APIs. You can find them all um, at this link. As Melissa said, we will share these slides. But there's a lot of cool things you can do with the different API and data feeds that we have. Integrating records, um, how do you trust records can be integrated into your catalog or through third party vendors. Uh, Graham Dethmers did a session on this last week. Um, the recording is available on our YouTube channel, but he did talk about the different ways that individual libraries can integrate either the copyrighted titles or items in the public domain into their own catalog and discovery layers. Um, we've worked with libraries using Primo, Summon, Alma, um, I think Voyager, um, he's really been gathering a list of best practices and could probably help you if you haven't done this already. Another great way to make sure that you're making the most of Hadi Trust is to promote Hadi Trust. Um, we have tried to make this easy for you. We've got a toolkit um, of materials, some videos, some tip sheets things for your reference desk um, to refer to. We encourage you to integrate Hadi Trust as a named resource in any of your own library instruction. Um, there are a lot of lib guides that our member libraries have created. So if you haven't created one, um, you could go check those out. The Emergency Temporary Access Service has its own suite of materials um, that you can use to promote that service on your campus as well. So we continually try to um, increase the number of items, the types of items, um, so if you have something in mind, uh, give me a shout, let me know, and we will put it on the list. How do you trust in the classroom? This is something I've been hearing a lot more about. Um, I think members want to hear more. I think particularly now that many of their patrons, their faculty, graduate students are doing so much more virtual work. They're really trying to understand how, how do you trust can really be used in a classroom. So we'll be thinking about that more deeply, tapping into some of our own member experts to help us um, talk about this more with more members more frequently. For now, I would say that these are some of the things that we have heard are helpful in the classroom. Um, I know some subject uh, liaison librarians use the full text search to help build bibliographies for faculty and for class use. Um, there is a feature to download citations in APA or MLA format. And then one thing that is really unique that does distinguish Hadi Trust from other digital libraries online is that our metadata has been curated and created by academic libraries for the academic community. So it's just the discoverability is different um, and you may be able to find things more easily in Hadi Trust for academic research and classroom work. How to get help if all of this is too much and too much for your patrons or you come up against some really sloppy OCR or some you know mislabeled items in the collection, you can get help. Um, Melissa had mentioned our Hadi Trust user support team. This is an invaluable team of individuals made up of member librarians from all over the country. Um, I don't know that we have any serving right now from non-US institutions, but there will be a call opening up, I think in the next month or so. So these individuals just dedicate their time and expertise to answering all the questions that come in um, from members and non-members alike. So 
next time you email feedback at issues.howdytrust.org, you are reaching out to a colleague. So um, we thank them for that. How do you trust Research Center has its own dedicated email support line if you have questions about anything happening in the How do you trust Research Center environment. So wrapping up here, how to get involved, you're doing it already. Um, just showing up tonight and really being interested in learning more about how do you trust is one way to be involved. Um, Melissa mentioned a number of the different working groups and task forces um, that are available. There are opportunities to join copyright review program teams at various points, as well as the user support team. Um, you can make sure that you are voting if you're a member representative. If you're not a member representative, you can find out um, what is being voted on. The newsletter is a great way to stay informed. That is something that comes out 10 times a year. And pretty much anything that we want to share with members. Um, if we don't already send it to you in an email, we do try to include it in the newsletter as well. So follow us on social media, sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already, um, get involved, tell us what you're doing. That's one of the big things. We know that there's so many really exciting things that people are either building on top of Hadi Trust <laughs> services or seeing happen in their own campus community. We love to hear about it because then we can share it with others and just keep spreading the good word. So with that, I will wrap it up and turn it back to you and find out what else do you need to know about? I mean, we are trying to fill your toolbox here and certainly we are open to answer any questions that you might have. Anybody have any questions? Um, feel free to type them into the chat. I know we just threw a lot of information at you <laughs> in a short amount of time. I'm curious what we left out. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> if you think of anything, you're welcome to, to send it to, oops, I didn't put the email there. I'll go back to that. Any questions that you have, feel free to send them to feedback at issues.howdytrust.org and we can follow up with you at that point. Yeah. And um, great. Oh, okay. wonderful. Thank you so much. And we're so glad you enjoyed it. And um, everyone have a great rest of your day. I'm going to stop. Wonderful. Here.